today's episode of the unwritten rule we've got a packed show uh we recorded the first part of the show on wednesday so we got some uh breaking news right before we started with khalil jacobs committing we're going to talk about that uh we'll also recap the two recent commitments for men's and women's basketball uh josh gray and tiana heron there uh we'll talk about those two um and then we have a great interview uh, talked with Karen Steger from Rock M previewing the Duke Super Regional for Mizzou softball. So, uh, yeah, got a great interview with Karen. Got some commits to talk about. All sorts of news. Uh, also, Kenny's power is back. So, Kenny was back uh, for the first part of the show uh, before we talked to Karen. So, that that's nice. We didn't have to uh, send any aid or anything to him. But, uh, yeah, we have a great show for you guys. And then we'll finish with uh, Quick Hits. we got Jersey of the Week, Shawnee's Main Birds, and the best things we learned. So pack show, fun show for you guys to get into your weekend. Again, a bunch of commits and looking ahead to the softball regional. So great show. Let's get it started. The unwritten rule starts right now. I just, I, Marcel, where are you going with that disc? You were not putting that on again. Marcel, okay, if you press that button, you are in very, very big trouble. Attention. Everybody stop what you're doing. It's time for The Unwritten Rule, a Mizzou sports podcast brought to you by the Believe Network, alongside Peyton Haverman and Kenny Van Doren. Here is your host, Jack Knowlton. Welcome back to The Unwritten Rule. Today is Friday, May 24th. And Kenny is back. He no longer he, oh, no. he has power returned to his house. I think we need to touch on this first before we dive into the the news that you see on screen. That was kind of breaking. We're recording the first part of the show on Wednesday. This happened right before we started. So very convenient. But Kenny, uh, welcome back. How was your time with no power? Um, I think it's kind of overrated. I think you'll start to learn that if you uh, go five nights without power, uh, I think you'll come to realize that you don't really need it. Uh, if you have a flashlight and uh, a bed and a mattress that you are willing to sweat through, I think you're in good shape. And that's what I did. Uh, I hate center point energy. It's the worst <laughs> thing in the world. They are the slowest people in the world. They do not care about their customers. Um, no free ads, but no free ads. I hate center point energy and energy companies are not on my good side right now. Uh, it's just a terrible like democratic system that they go through to get things done. And it took forever. I finally have power back. Uh, it's fine now. Let's get into the show. All right. So much for that future sponsorship. That, that bridge has been burned. Uh, yeah, well, we're glad you had power anyway, Kenny. But uh, we have breaking, kind of breaking news, like we said, uh, right before we started recording here on Wednesday for the first part of the show. Uh, Mizzou got a commit. Uh, Khalil Jacobs from South Alabama. He's a linebacker, played two seasons at South Alabama. Now is coming to Mizzou, where, of course, he'll reunite with his defensive coordinator at South Alabama, Corey Batoon. He'll be back in his system. Jacob's an interesting prospect. Uh, if you look last season, had 25 solo tackles, 56 total, uh, a couple of forced fumbles, three, in fact, three sacks as well, and a pick uh, at linebacker. 6'2", 215, a little bit on the smaller side for the linebacker position, but nevertheless, some nice depth, I feel like, here, Peyton and Kenny. Uh, and obviously the, the connection to Batoon, knowing the system, uh, is a plus as well. What do we think of uh, Mizzou's addition here out of the transfer portal, sophomore Khalil Jacobs? Uh, you know, it's always good to get someone that, I mean, took a visit to Alabama, I suppose. Obviously, there's staff connections both there. I mean, Kane Womack, Alabama's D.C., was South Alabama's head coach. Corey Batoon was, of course, the D.C. at South Alabama before coming to Mizzou. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a good ad. I mean, the stats don't jump off the page at you, but familiarity is always a good thing. Uh, we'll see if he winds up starting or not. I mean, it, but I would feel pretty good about Mizzou's, uh, outlook, uh, and how it's shaping up at linebacker. I mean, your top four right now would be flag Jacobs, Newsom, and Hicks. I mean, that's a two of those four should be able to give you pretty good snaps, I would think, um, as we look, or as Mizzou, rather, looks to replace uh, Tyron Hopper and Chad Bailey. Chad Bailey didn't play much last year, but, and at times, Hicks and 
Newsom both looked very good. Um, other times they did not look as good, but we'll see what winds up happening at the linebacker position. I feel very confident in that position group. Yeah, I think last year was just an eye opener of how much depth you need at this position. Uh, he losing, I mean, you mentioned Bailey not playing most of the season. Hopper missed a good amount of the season as well. And so having, you know, Khalil Jacobs having experience, having familiarity, like you mentioned, this is huge. Like it's huge. And you mentioned a little bit on the smaller side, he's about the same size as Tristan Newsom. And I think that's good. Looking at the linebackers here, if you're watching on the YouTube, just a little bit of the sizes, you, know, you do have some of those bigger guys and Corey Flagg, who's up to 230 and Dara Smith, who's at 240. But uh, this is a, a good pickup to have depth just moving forward. And, and I think last season, you know, showed that, that you needed guys with experience and you can't really rely on some of these freshmen that are coming in. And, you know, Brayshawn Littlejohn still has, you know, received a lot of um, positive reviews from DJ Smith and that defensive staff, uh, so staff moving forward. And so and these guys will, will work into special teams as well. And it, it looks just like a good group, uh, a good deep group right now. Yeah. He, I mean, he was kind of a depth piece, actually. It doesn't seem like it with, with his, uh, stats, but he, he only started three of, uh, South Alabama's 13 games last year. So, uh, you know, he, I mean, he, he kind of made the most of his, his minutes and I think he's kind of going to be in the same role at Mizzou. So if any of that trans, you know, transfers, I think, I think, you know, yeah, like you guys said, you're going to be in for, uh, you know, pretty good player, uh, and, a and just an overall solid addition. I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's interesting with, with Chuck Hicks and with Tristan Newsom, you know, kind of the momentum they got, the good momentum they got from that bowl game. Uh, you know, I think put them in a, in in maybe a better light for having like a little bit more of a bit part role for most of the year, and then you know, kind of stepping up in moments after Tyron Hopper got hurt. So, no reason why uh, you know you don't bring Jacobs in. He probably pushes these two. He knows the Batoon system, and uh, you know, yeah, comes in and and Corey and Corey Flag as well. Obviously, you know, like Peyton said, is is probably going to take one of those spots. So. We'll see how it goes at the linebacker position, but it's nice to have another addition. Nice to have a guy, I think, that knows this defensive scheme that Corey Batoon is 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 going to bring in. Him and Kane uh, Womack at, at South Alabama did good things on the defensive side of the ball last year. So um, I think that'll be one of the biggest kind of bridges is is how you go from Blake Baker to Corey Batoon. You know, we've talked about that. and We'll talk about it again, I'm sure, as, as we get closer to the season. But yeah, Khalil Jacobs out of South Alabama. The sophomore will have uh, two seasons of eligibility remaining. I always forget to say that, too. So he'll, he'll, he'll be there probably for a little bit of time, unless he has a crazy breakout year. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, South Alabama, Khalil Jacobs going to Mizzou. Uh, staying on the transfer front, uh, fellas, we have basketball transfers to talk about, men's and women's. These uh, happened a couple of days ago. We decided to save them for Friday. Uh, just mostly wanted to focus on the on the softball kind of hype with, with that. Uh, but Mizzou men's basketball got another transfer addition. Dennis continues to cook in the portal. This is a guy uh, we talked, we've talked about a little bit. Josh Gray from South Carolina uh, makes things official seven footer. Uh, I think it's exciting to have a, an experienced big man here for the Tigers and Dennis Gates played three seasons in South Carolina, one year at LSU doesn't have, you know, the most eye popping stats on the surface, but Peyton Kenny, what do you guys think of uh, Josh Gray? I think you know we can we can you can segue this conversation too and talk a little lineups because I know you know I think this this maybe shakes things up a little bit for for how the Tigers maybe roll out to start games. But what do we think of Josh Gray uh, coming in from South Carolina, experienced uh, big here in the portal? Uh, I think it's a very very good pickup, and not because I think he's going to come in and drop ten and eight every game and play 30 minutes, but because he is going to be able to play 15, 20 minutes a game, maybe split time with Peyton Marshall uh, at the five, or when Mizzou runs small, they can just have someone else at the five, like maybe have Mark Mitchell kind of play that role, or maybe Aiden Shaw. There's a lot of possibilities, but what Josh Gray gives you is something that we have really been outright begging uh, Mizzou to find in two years under uh, Dennis Gates. And that's a five that can just stand under the basket, really protect the rim. Well, grab a couple boards. He's he, like the, the thing about Josh Gray, he's not going, he's not going to give you too much offensively. I would imagine he really probably doesn't need to in certain lineups. I mean, you can have Mark Mitchell 
kind of run that sort of offense when he's in. You know, Caleb Grill can light it up from deep. Tamar Bates, you have a lot of different ways you can go with Josh Gray on the floor. But one thing that will probably remain the same is that Josh Gray will patrol the paint. He'll block shots. He'll grab defensive boards. He'll try and limit those second opportunities that have absolutely plagued Mizzou's defense uh, at times over the past two years. Um, I think it's a good pickup. I don't think Josh Gray is going to totally change the season, but I think he's a useful piece to have. Um, I certainly think Mizzou is better off with Josh Gray than without him. Yeah, I, I kind of want to you know lump him into like the low risk, high reward because you you know you want to you want him to fit these needs, and it's not very hard for him to fit those needs at seven foot and with four years of experience in the SEC, especially when he started fifteen games two seasons ago. Um, but if he can provide more than just that, what you're saying, Peyton, that's huge. Like I, we talk about it a lot over the last couple of weeks, going into the transfer portal and getting guys with power five experience, not just like the best guys at the group of five level at the mid major level, mm -hmm. the ones that are excelling like Warwick. Uh, you, you want guys that, you know, have had, had experience and can plug into the needs you've had these last two years, like two glaring, uh, one big glaring need the last two seasons under Dennis Gates. And that's what Josh Gray does. And I think when you we can segue here now, looking at where our starting fives were when we did this a couple weeks ago, you know, for myself, you know, I think it'll fluctuate based on need for each game. And I think we've seen that the last two years from Dennis Gates. And like we mentioned the starting five will change constantly throughout the season, just based on who's playing well and based on matchups. But I think right now for myself, I did have Peyton Marshall at that five and I would keep the, the, the same four I had, but I think Josh Gray would definitely slide in there if they needed that need that size at the beginning of the game um, come November. I think, and, and Peyton, I'm going to steal this point from, from you because we talked about this, uh, I think off air a little bit. I like the idea of Josh Gray, yes, starting and, and just being that, you know, he has the most limited minutes as, as the starter. I think he's, you know, kind of the guy you swap in and out for Peyton Marshall. He comes in, he wins the tip, he establishes a presence, you know, on the glass, in the paint, on both ends of the floor. And then, you know, once that presence is established, you can kind of go from there. You know, if you need a bit more offense, you maybe you maybe limit him for for the rest of the game. Obviously, if you're if you're in a kind of like Kenny said, if you're in a situation where you need a lot of rim protection, you need a lot of rebounding, you need a lot of help there. You you keep him in the game for longer, and he will you know give you some solid contributions. So I think you're right. It's instead of looking at it as like oh it's not a home run from an output standpoint where he was before. You look at it as you know this is a guy that come that comes in and gives you you know, more options as games goes on. He's a guy you can stick in there and you know he's going to be uh, a valid option. Unlike, you know, as much as Connor Vanover, you know, played, obviously they're very different players. I know he had power five experience, but he wasn't a guy, I don't think necessarily that you were trusting, you know, consistently to give you great rim protection. He, he, he did that at times, but I think, he, I think you're right. I think, you know, while it might not be the explosive output, whether it's scoring or, or, you know, that, that factor, you're not going to get that from Josh Gray, but you don't need that from him. You put him in he, exactly like Peyton said, he cleans up the glass. He defends the paint. Well. Uh, and I think, I think that's where he makes his impact. You got anything Peyton that does that sound? I know we talked about that. Off yeah, no, I mean, that's just basically what I'd expect. I just, I, I did pose the question. I think it was to you. I'm pretty sure just in terms of being a true a true outright center. Mm -hmm. Josh Gray is probably the best one Dennis Gates has had on a roster in his three years at Missouri. It's not a high bar to clear, believe me. Um, but I mean, Mo Diara, we saw it, what he did at NC state last year at the four position playing next to DJ Burns. He didn't really do that at Mizzou because they had Kobe Brown at the four and they tried to have Diara play the five and he wasn't really, that wasn't really his game. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure just in terms of being a straight up traditional center, like a true what you want out of a five, Josh Gray is probably the best center that Missouri has had in three years under Dennis Gates. Yeah, again, not not a high bar, but I think you you do make the good point of it's like, you know, when it comes to fit, when Muhammad Diara came in, I think we all thought one thing of where he'd fit. And then it turns out, you know, he was better as a four. He wasn't a true, 
a true big. Josh Gray is a true big. You know exactly where you're getting out of him, and it's a need for Mizzou. So I think it's a great uh, addition here for for the Tigers and and for some you know hopeful rim protection against. You know, the SEC is a big league. Like, they're, they're, he's, think about well, – this is getting into the nitty-gritty, and we'll talk about this closer to the season. But they're, he's going to go against some some dudes down low. And so to have a guy like that with a lot of experience and height and girth, I don't know, uh, it's going to be nice just to have, you know, that in the, in the paint. Um, I don't know if that was the best, best word choice. But we're moving on. Josh Gray's a good addition. Uh, here for the Tigers, adding some. Size. Would you make if you if you had come yeah. into the off season asking, would you trade Jordan Butler for Josh Gray? Would you have made that trade? Yes, I would have made that trade. If would you're talking you? about what you want, obviously, like, like Jordan Butler has some kind of fun projectable skills. But I mean, if you're if you're talking about who's going to put you in the best position to win next year, I think yeah, yeah, you trade for now. I yeah. think I think yeah. you make win that now. <laughs> yeah, Dennis I think. Dennis Jordan Winnie Butler in the long term could wind up being the better player. And I'm not saying Dennis Gates made this trade, by the way. Um, I'm not at all inferring that he forced. Uh, I like we're calling it a trade. Yeah. Well, it essentially is. I mean, yeah. I'm not inferring that Dennis Gates said, oh, you got to go, Jordan Butler. I honestly pretty much doubt that that is what happened. Um, but M- Missouri needs to take a few steps forward, not just a step forward next year. Um, it, it's a big cleanup job. So I think it's a pretty worthwhile trade-off roster-wise to have Josh Gray over Jordan Butler. No doubt. Uh, so, yeah, Josh Gray, senior, four years of SEC experience, three with Carolina, South Carolina, and one with LSU coming to join the Missouri Tigers here next season. Um, on the women's basketball front, Peyton and Kenny – um, we got another Robin Pinchton edition as well. Uh, a little bit younger than, than Josh Gray, a little bit less experienced, but, uh, Tiana Heron from Texas is joining the women's basketball team. She becomes the, uh, fourth transfer edition for the Tigers. Uh, Lanaya Randall, Naya Wilson, and Tilda Shajakvist. I think I got that right. Thank you for putting the pronunciation guide in Kenny. Hopefully I, hopefully I nailed that. We'll learn it as the season goes on, but, um, Heron coming in again, you know, not super impressive stats, but just a freshman, uh, you know, only played in 11 games last year for Texas. So maybe trying to get a little bit of a, a, a jump start to her college career. So obviously some potential there, um, you know, six, four center here is a, another big coming in for, for Mizzou, but Robin Pinchton doing some solid work in the transfer portal. I mean, now, you know, her, her job feels a little bit more secure considering, you know, since, uh, Laird's come in the new AD hasn't decided to make a move with the women's basketball coach. It's, it's pretty evident now that Robin Pinchon's going to be locked in for another season and doing some solid work on the transfer portal here, Peyton and Kenny. Yeah. On paper, this seems like a very, very solid move. I mean, clearly six, four center. I mean, that could translate into a very, very, very good player. Um, if developed properly, um, now it's a question of can Pinchton and her staff develop uh, Heron and help her turn into uh, the SEC caliber big that she could be, um, because that is something that Missouri has struggled with under Pinchton in recent years. I mean, they've had a lot; they've been able to get a lot of high level recruits to come to Mizzou. The problem has been in development. I mean, I think of uh, Jada Kelly uh, just of just a couple of years ago. I mean, she was a big time top hundred ESPNW recruit. Um, just never really was able to develop or really progress uh, under Pinchton and she eventually transferred away. So maybe Pinchton and the staff can do it this time. Uh, we'll have to see. I like this move on paper because like you said, I mean, six, four, that's, that's, that's a, that could be a very big, uh, addition if you can get Heron into an SEC level player, but we'll have to just wait and see if Ms. Pinchin and her uh, staff have developed their recruiting chops or developed their developing chops rather. <laughs> um, to, anyway, to be honest, hi, it's good because you look at last season, I believe there were there was uh, one player six foot six and then two six foot four. So I mean, it, it's you know it's good height, especially bringing in from the from the Big Twelve. Um, I guess now technically an SEC transfer, 
But uh, I mean, Tiana coming in with, with that experience of being with the second best team in the Big 12 last year, um, you kind of you got to like that. You got to like that. And what Peyton said about development, hopefully that that plays into the factor for her moving forward. OK, I have more news on Tiana Heron and shout out our friends over at Rock M. So this is really interesting and probably offers lends a better explanation to some limited playing time. So Tiana Heron was originally a recruit in the class of 2022. She actually signed with Kentucky to start her career. Uh, and then before she had, before she got to Kentucky again, before the 2022, 23 season. Uh, so two years ago, um, she had a heart abnormality and went through open heart surgery, missed the entire season with Kentucky and transferred to Texas. So she was never cleared to play with Kentucky. So it's been a long road back for her. So, I mean, definitely, first of all, it's great that she was able to come back ultimately and keep playing a um, bit of a bit of a Bronny James situation, similar, similar kind of thing there. But um, so it's been a grind. She's, uh, you know, worked her way back, obviously. And like Peyton said, now hopefully Mizzou can uh, can develop her at the or now with the Tigers at her at her third school. And hopefully that sticks her nickname also is tree, which seems fitting for, you know, what, what position she's going to play in her height there. So there you go. Um, but yeah, so a long journey for her and hopefully, you know, obviously that, that story can have a, a good ending here now with the Tigers. She does still have three seasons uh, of eligibility remaining. Oh, look at that. And she played against Kansas as Kenny's highlighting in the, in the thing. So she already has points. experience beating Kansas two points. Beautiful. Um, so yeah, uh, Mizzou women's basketball also has one roster spot left now. They had five players to part, and they've now brought four in the transfer portal. So Robin could still look to fill one more spot with Tiana Hare and Josh Gray, the latest additions for basketball. Um, let's get to our interview, or I guess my interview, because these two uh, didn't participate. I'm just kidding. They, they, had, they had other other obligations. Uh, but I'll kick it to myself, uh, talking to Karen Steger. Uh, I interviewed her. We previewed the... Uh, Duke Super Regional. Great interview with Karen. So we will get you to that. Okay, we now welcome on a very special guest. It is Rock M Nation's Karen Steger. And I say we, it's just me uh, doing this interview. I don't know. I don't remember the last time on this show we've had just a, I don't know if we've ever had a one-on-one -on -one interview, but Kenny and Peyton, uh, we, we talked to Karen off air before this. They felt bad. They couldn't be here. But we had to get this, this interview in before, of course, Mizzou Softball Super Regional against Duke and we're going to we're going to talk on the Blue Devils but I think you know we we have to have a proper recap with someone who is in attendance for these games against Omaha uh last Sunday and it, you know me and Peyton did a recap of this you know ourselves as best we could I watched the games on TV but I want to start there I mean obviously you know every Mizzou fan has seen by this point you know the thrill whether they were there or watched it on TV mm -hmm. just the, the thrilling two games against Omaha for Mizzou to make this ultimate comeback they win four games in two days win the regional uh and are now going to host the super regional against Duke um so just first and foremost the atmosphere during those two games how much of a roller coaster of it was it uh you know considering these these were two very close games, uh, you know, up until up until the, the late stages. The second one required a walk off, which we'll get to. But I mean, Mizzou does four games in two days, ends up winning the regional, Karen. Yeah, I did not see this coming. <laughs> it, it's kind of crazy because the other people that I was talking to in the press box, we all were kind of like, well, you know, know that Omaha got them in the first game, but they'll be fine, you know, when Washington undoubtedly beats them or something, you know, we'd mm -hmm. rather, we'd rather face Omaha again than have to face Washington. And it turns out that <laughs> rather face Washington, I guess, because that one, <laughs> that one went better, but it just, it was awesome. It was so loud. It, despite the fact that it was hot as hell outside, like it was disgusting. <laughs> it was really hot in the press box too. They told us that they were going to turn on the air conditioning. I don't think that ever happened. It was, <laughs> it was so bad. Classic. It's a classic. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was an incredible performance. Um, the pitching was unreal. I, 
speechless. <laughs> I, have no, I don't even know how to describe how Lauren Krings worked and how it seemed like, especially in the, the final game that she had 15 strikeouts and just like kept going more and yep. more strikeouts as she went on. And I was like, I don't understand how she's doing that. Um, coach said today it was adrenaline. She told her that it was that makes sense. <laughs> mainly going on adrenaline at that point. And she cannonballed into a cold tub afterwards. <laughs> as, as she probably should. As I, she I probably needed. That. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of felt once they won that first game on Sunday, I just had this feeling they were going to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they tried to make me believe they weren't going to do it <laughs> like, <laughs> as long as the game went and they just weren't manufacturing any runs or anything. But as well as Lauren was pitching, I just don't think, I didn't think that there was any way that they weren't going to figure out a way to get it done or finally get to Sydney whatever her last name was, I forgot already. <laughs> well, no, that, that's actually, I wanted to bring that up because, you know, I, I was sitting, we can talk about the pitching on, on both sides, like you mentioned, because, you know, I'm sitting there as someone who watched this team, you know, lose kind of heartbreakingly against James Madison a couple of years ago, where they yes. also faced just a red hot pitcher from a mid-major team. It was, it was a, yeah. here we go again. So it was Cameron Meyer. And then, you know, I, I know how big of a sigh of relief I, I breathed when I was like, all right, she's finally coming out. She's finally exhausted. Yeah. And then in her comes arms the, finally dislodged from her body. <laughs> exactly. And then in comes Sydney Nussmeyer, who dude then does the same thing, uh, you know, and has a really good game in that second game. But then, you know, just like you said, it was a pitcher's duel. I mean, Lauren Krings, it was it was spectacular. The 15 strikeouts, like you said, she had 24 over the regional, uh, played 25 innings in two games, 0.56 ERA. Um, I, I think she deserves, you know all the flowers in the world and she's gotten yeah. some she's i mean she got an appetizer named after her at uh <laughs> at, at the broadway diner that was pretty yeah. good but i mean it, touch on the omaha pitching how, how, as much as you'd like but lauren krings i mean you, you mentioned plunging in the cold cold tub well-deserved honor for for her efforts i mean that, that was one of the better performances i think i've seen from a mizzou athlete period i think so too um and i had read something that gabe german had written on power mizzou he was talking about that as well, that like that has to go down as like one of the best performances like that anyone can remember in Mizzou history. Like it just in that situation, win or go home, it was phenomenal. Just, I don't, I'd say I don't know how she did it, but like in retrospect, the reason why she was able to do it is because Mizzou has so many arms on their staff mm -hmm. and they're rested. They weren't killed throughout the season pitching, you know, over 200 innings going complete games every time out. And I think that that really allowed her to do what she did because she wasn't overworked during the season. Now I heard, I obviously was at the game, so I didn't listen to them, but I mm -hmm. did hear some, chatter about whether or not the analyst thought that she was actually an ace because she didn't pitch complete games or something like that. <laughs> and I was and I was just like, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, not it's like, great. no, Mizzou's just different that they have a loaded staff. And I think it it sets them up well for this weekend also. Yeah, I I, th I think that's really interesting. It's it's the depth kind of coming in because it, it was you know you you don't realize and then you get into these games how how much of a pitcher's battle it can be and that obviously is what hurt Cameron Meyer. Like you know everyone's sitting there like oh Omaha can't go to anybody. Mizzou you knew could have gone to to somebody right. else. You you got to a point where you almost didn't want them to just because Laura yeah. Springs was playing so well. You want to leave the hot hand out there, but I mean you know the, and this has been kind of widely out there now you know, just on her resilience and, and stuff. She's obviously, you know, she's done this for a long time. She's, she's, you know, one of the older players on this team, mm -hmm. you know, there's the, the interaction between her and, and coach Larissa Anderson, where, you know, she said to go as hard as you can, Lauren Krings, you know, it's the, it's the, you know, I've got one more in me. I've got more left in the tank. I can, yeah. I can give you more of that. And I want to get into some other of the veteran players on this team, but, you know, I, I guess the, 
just t- touch on this team's just grit overall. I, I know you I know you wrote a piece at, at how they kind of gelled together and go into a, a movie preseason. Uh, you know, how is how is Kring's kind of exemplified maybe just where this team is at to where they got to the point to gut out these four wins when they knew their their season was on the line? The one thing that Anderson's talked about all season is just how motivated and together this team has been the entire season. And actually I went and looked back at what I wrote about the 2021 team. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where my previews headed (laughs) is the parallels between the two teams. Um, And they are very similar. Um, Maybe the, Offense isn't as home run happy as the 2021 team was, but the way that they play together, the determination at which they just come to practice ready to go. She's talked about how she didn't have to really motivate either team. Like they, they had it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's been the biggest thing for them is that they want to win they know what they need to do to get there and they're just going to fight like hell to get it done. And if, if they lose their, like they, they, somebody, I think Jenna said um, on Saturday, it's post game. I think all the days are running together. I spent like 25 <laughs> hours. Of they all blend. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. What is, what is time anymore? Um, She said, like, basically they're at the point now, like they've done everything that they can. They know that they're going to go out there. They're going to put everything they have on the field. And if they happen to lose, then they happen to lose. And Mm -hmm. it's just focusing on this one game at a time. And I think that's, it worked for them when they've had success this season it's just worrying about that one game. So, like, they're not focused on making the World Series. They're focused on tomorrow only. And I think that that is very similar to the 2021 team, too. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up, especially with what uh, Coach Anderson said about the, the motivation. I thought that was a really interesting quote that I read in your piece where – you know, she said, I think it was that she felt exhausted, you know, wake, last season, you know, waking up and having to to constantly get this team to play for one another. And and this year, you know, that doesn't happen. And you see, you know, how far that can get you. I thought that was uh, really interesting. Can you talk about the uh, the movie night? Because I really enjoyed that piece. And I, I don't I won't do it justice uh, you know, explaining <laughs> that story. But so, you know, my parents how, how were they, really excited and wrote about yeah. that, too, because they love that movie. <laughs> So that was part of her post-game press conference on Sunday. She was talking about how about this. They had this movie night where they went to go see this movie called The Boys in the Boat, which is about a rowing team at the University of Washington and how these people from all walks of life came together on this team, went through all of this stuff together and ended up qualifying for the Olympics place in the Olympics. And it's based on a true story. And she basically used it as a way to say that in order to get to where they need to go, everybody needs to be rowing in the same direction in unison. And she talked about how she's talked all season about how last year it was not like that. People were out to get theirs. It's they're rowing in really different directions and you never would have known that. Like they didn't always look like they were having the best time. Like unlike Mm -hmm. this team that always seems like they're having the greatest time of their lives constantly. But so like in retrospect, I can kind of see it, but I, she never said anything about that last year, but she is noticeably lighter this Mm -hmm. year. Like she really seems to, just be enjoying herself. Like she mot- motivates him now. With, she puts candy in her pocket at the third base. <laughs> <laughs> the third base. 
coach and when they get to third base she gives them like watermelon <laughs> water, watermelon uh oh my like sour, sour, patch kids. Rancher or sour patch kids so she i asked her like the last question like off air she was leaving and i was like coach what candy are you using for regionals like did you <laughs> Get different kinds. She's like, no, I'm still using watermelon sour, sour patch kids. But she said that they had like congealed in her pocket. Oh jeez. So oh jeez. <laughs> Just melted. She's like, I gotta figure out different candy to use. Yeah, you can't have any chocolate. There's no chocolate. You can't yeah. do chocolate because that'll be done. I, 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 <laughs> I got the image in my head. I think that's great. And I, hey, I mean, you know, it's always a good incentive. I got the image of that bird love. Part of it, it's like you know how you have like your grandma or someone else where they always have the old like rock hard candy in their, yeah. <laughs> their purse of random Here's time. Here's the Werther's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit better than that, but yeah, I, I mean that that's awesome, and I, I think you know it, it's so it's so funny, right? We, like how you you notice that, especially you know covering a team. Yeah, the subtleties, like whether the coach says it or not, you can tell when a team, especially a college team, I feel like is playing together and playing for each other mm -hmm. rather than playing for themselves. I think, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, like you said, this is where, you know, that kind of gets to. Well, like, cause they let, they let everybody just kind of be their weird selves and mm -hmm. be who they are. Like at one point during the season, one of the last games, my, yeah. One of the last games, it was Abby Hay and Lauren Krings in the post game. And we were talking about something silly that like the team was doing and, and Lauren's just like, yeah, that's all on them. Like <laughs> point at Abby, she's like, we just let them, you know, do whatever, whatever they want to do. And we're just like, Oh, something new that they came up with, but mm -hmm. throwing a chair in a in the dugout back and forth <laughs> or like making up weird cheers or like, they just, they come up with some crazy stuff, but everybody, it doesn't seem like people see it as an annoyance. Like mm -hmm. they're all, they play better when they're having fun and acting foolish. So it's been a joy to cover yeah. for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. Again, you kind of notice that we need, I think for those watching on TV, we need more dugout shots like that. I want, I want more of those funny moments on the, on the, on the TV broadcast as well. When they, when they show things like that. Um, we tried to get some photographs of it because yeah. rock him as a photographer this year. And we, we'd be texting Cal and be like, Cal, they're doing something weird with a chair. Get a picture of that. <laughs> Go get that. And then, <laughs> and then we, then we'd ask like what the dancer like, what are they doing? Like beg, what are they begging coach for? And that's how we found out about the candy. Oh, sure. Because she'd come over and they're all like hanging over the railing and stuff. <laughs> the, like, the photographer's like, a third reporter. Yeah. Like, what is happening over there? <laughs> I've uh I, I've noticed too, and this this is something you know you brought up uh you know when we had you on the first time, and you know I'm I'm curious whether it's any you noticed anything on field. Obviously, we've talked about I think just this team's mindset kind of evolving. You know, you you, you talked a lot about how you know this team kind of struggled to close out you know series a little bit, whether it was mm -hmm. that third game to kind of get that sweep, or in this case. You know, it's it's your season on the line. Obviously, right. I think those those higher stakes naturally raise raise their games. But w was there anything like tactically you saw Coach Anderson change or, or anything like that 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 you know you, you noticed made a little bit of a difference in addition to obviously you know this team kind of you know you know coming together like mentally to to overcome that. Um. So, Coach said today that. Mm -hmm. When the game went into extra innings, that last game, that she said Julia Crenshaw noticed that they they seemed to be losing a little pep in their step. And so she approached coach and said something along the lines of like, I need you to rally us. Like, we need some sort of speech, like to get us going to make sure that we get there. And then... Mm -hmm. I guess she did it and it worked because <laughs> they got it going. Um, so I think they have people on their team that recognize when they need, they need something, a little extra yeah. something to get them going. Yeah. I thought that that was a pretty cool moment that she talked about that. 
because they all were, I mean, dead tired. It was over a hundred <laughs> degrees on the field. They said, Ugh. just, I can't even imagine how, I mean, yeah. I was hot sitting indoors. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, one thing, you know, I'm curious with the, you know, we mentioned with this team dynamic and I think it's especially interesting, you know, how well they've come together. This is a team with, with, you know, several seniors and then several freshmen, you know, they've sort of got, I, I put it, I put it, you, we were talking about the game a little bit after, uh, you know, I was, I was thinking about it and it's, it's almost, it feels like, you know, there's the golden state warriors in the NBA at one point had, they had like a two timeline thing going on where they had like Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, all these older guys. And then they, they got a bunch of young, good rookies and that didn't work at all for them. But with this team, it, it seems to work. How do you notice, you know, obviously the veterans stepping up to, to lead this younger group. And I want to get into a couple of freshmen in particular and what they did against Omaha in a second, but how do you notice the veterans stepping up to lead them and then vice versa, how, you know, these kind of young, certainly hungry to prove themselves, you know, freshmen push the veterans kind of back and that dynamic kind of works. Um, I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was a I was a loaded one. I, I know. <laughs> well, I'm even curious. I mean, in the like in particular, some of the freshmen, like you know, I mean, you have Abby Hay and, and Madison Walker, who you know, obviously Madison Walker, a hero herself, uh, you know, stepping up with the walk off. I mean, that's that's a that's a big moment to step up, and certainly yeah. a lot of credit goes to her. But I mean, even over the course of the season, you know, how big is is the you know maybe leadership on this team, and then. You know, she does the same thing where she's setting up Alex Honnold, a, a veteran, you know, to hit mm -hmm. a walk off home run. I guess that that felt like an example to me, you know, that that kind of I dynamic. I think it's that they don't see it as like you're a veteran mm -hmm. and you're a freshman. It's just everybody together. It's they're such a team and they all know that even if they're not in the game, so like Shantice Phillips has seen her playing time decrease a lot. Mm -hmm. She's still an amazing person to have in the dugout, encouraging her teammates, trying to figure, you know, give her, give the people that are playing pointers on pitches to look for and things like that. So they don't have egos. So when Anderson makes changes and like puts Abby Hay at first base, Katie Chester wasn't upset that, or at least not that we know, you know, Katie Chester <laughs> wasn't upset that her, her spot got taken over by a freshman. They're all so focused on this one singular goal, like moving the boat forward, like in the movie, that it really doesn't, the the age different, you know, the class difference between them. I don't think it, I don't think it matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that goes all the way back to what you said, where, I mean, that, that's a hard thing, like to put your egos aside like that, especially as yeah. an older player, you've been around the block. And, you know, I know a lot of people I'm sure would, would be like, oh, I'm not letting this, you know, freshman tell me what to do or, or, you know, listening to them or what do they know? Like, I, I think that's a really hard thing to do. So I think that's, that's, you know, pretty remarkable that they've been able to do that with kind of this yeah. interesting dynamic of you have these veterans going out. But also, you know, and then for, for me as a fan, it makes me more relieved because these are names where I realize, oh, this is, you know, the last time I'll see, you know, Lauren Krings, Jenna Laird, Alex Honnold, these yeah. players have become these staples, but sad. you have, <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, it's, it's sad and then, but you know, now you have Madison Walker and, and Abby Hay and, and some of these others stepping up and to, to get into them, you know, specifically, just kind of go back to their, their moments. I mean, Abby Hay, like, like you said, you know, has done a great job at first base since she's been put in there. Madison Walker. I mean, what a way to start your career. I mean, obviously, right. hopefully she has, you know, far more big moments and, and a lot more of those for, for the rest of her time with Mizzou softball. But uh, just talk about those two in particular. I mean, how, how big are they going to be just for the, the future of this program? Obviously, hope this season goes on as long as it can. But, uh, you know, 
with just their their contributions at the highest you know level at the, the with the most pressure on them yeah. at home to to step up like that. Well, with Madison, what's really interesting is that at the beginning of the season, I think we all thought that she was going to play a ton mm -hmm. because she started the season playing first base. Like she was in the lineup every day for multiple months, I think. And then she had, I had gone and looked back, like she had like a, four or five game stretch where she didn't get any hits at all. So I think that was when coach started trying out Abby and then Abby was doing so well that it was kind of like, well, you can't take Abby out of the lineup. Um, but she said, Madison told us, cause she was one of the people that we talked to after mm -hmm. the game that, she knew that she needed to do better physically and mentally. Um, so she just stayed in the background, worked on her swing, worked on her mental side, and just kept working at it, hoping that she would get another chance. And coach said at one point, like, okay, I think you're ready. So like they tried to get her in as a pinch hitter, against Indiana. Mm -hmm. And then that was when the weird thing happened with the plate with Julia Crenshaw with the obstruction or out of the baseline or whatever <laughs> mess that yeah. was. So she didn't even end up getting to bat. And then they decided to go with whoever she had replaced. I think it was Averscato or something like that. They went back to just having Averscato <laughs> <laughs> bat. So she just like lost her at bat. But she did tell us that like, even though she didn't even swing when she was up there. She was in such a good headspace that she knew that if she batted at that moment, that something good was going to happen. And yeah. so she just kind of took that into when she got her next chance. And she had, I mean, that first game of Sunday, that was a big, a big hit for her. And then of course the one up the middle to win the whole thing. Like it was really awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, you know, that's a, yeah, she, she set herself up. She's going to have all the pressure on her now for the next, next four I years. With, with I was like, I feel like we're going to see her as a pinch hitter. Yeah. More um, <laughs> and, and the single too. I mean, you, I know you wrote about how good the Omaha defense had been, you know, all, all weekend, essentially, yeah. even not against Mizzou. So to, to sneak that one by, uh, was definitely very satisfying. I, I, I ran around my apartment yelling. Uh, that, that, was, <laughs> that was the Jack camera. I was very excited. I was I was <laughs> cheering in my head because, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. A professional. <laughs> Number one rule. It is, yeah, it is tough sometimes. Um, so, I, you know, now we're looking forward, obviously, you know, Duke coming up. Before before we get into, you know, what you what you think of them and, and, uh, and you know, kind of, kind of what you're what you're assessing there with Mizzou playing Duke I want to ask you about this because I saw this quote tweeted I think it was Gabe tweeted out what um coach Anderson said she just said nothing stands out about us nothing's flashy other than the fact we have 47 wins I really like that quote I feel like you have to have some flash to get to 47 wins but you know I I, I guess just she said you, that several times this season yeah. that like that's the the mantra that's the like kind of best thing about them because they're always the underdog. No one ever believes that they're going to do it because they don't have stats that jump out at you. They don't have, you know, 400 hitter, like 400 hitters all through their lineup. You know, they don't, they don't have somebody with 12 complete games or whatever. Um, so She's yeah, she said that a bunch of times. And I think that's what makes people underestimate them, which is great for them because then it's like they don't nobody sees them coming. <laughs> <laughs> that's I, I, I really admire that, especially, you know, considering they were hosting the regional. They're, you know, a, a top yeah. team in the, in the country. But nobody the thought they were gonna make it through. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, by all means, I know, again, that, that made me think of another example in my head with in, in football, that's always Kirby smart. Georgia's head coach was great at doing that. They won a national championship. And then the next year 
you know, he, he, I remember his players would say like, yeah, he made us think no one thought, no one believed in us and no one thought we were good. And it, it seems like coach Anderson, as much as they, you know, maybe on paper were favored, it's, you know, it's yeah. Letting them see, Hey, no one believes in you. No one is buying in, but. Well, and also there were so many people that didn't believe that they should be host. They should have been a top eight team that they should have been even hosting oh, yeah. a super regional. So like people just counted them out from mm. the start. I know they were on like, that. That's that... kind of dangerous to count out this team. <laughs> I, I remember they, yeah, they were, they were on the border of that. You know, are they going to get one? Are there, you know, I know Duke was one of those other teams. I think Stanford yeah. was in the mix as well. So they end up getting one. Um, and yeah, that definitely, and, and, you know, now you're playing Duke. So yeah, getting into the, getting into the blue devils a little bit, uh, Karen, I know you have an article coming out on them a little bit tomorrow. And, and, uh, you said you're talking about comparing this team with 2021, of course, got to the supers then. Um, and so obviously everyone should go read that. Uh, but from Duke, from, from what you saw, what you know about the blue devils, I know they have, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting off the top of my head, how many games I know they have a very long winning streak coming into this. Um, I don't know what their winning streak is, but they did win 50 games. <laughs> yeah, they won 50 games. <laughs> and they're like so, 50 and 6 or something, like crazy. Yeah, it's, something it's, crazy. It, it's, it's an absurd record. So, you know, they've they've got the resume. They've got, you know, a lot of those wins. Uh, who are, you know, if you have a, a key player to watch, what what should uh, the people know about Duke going into this, this hopefully uh, only two-game series because Mizzou wins both games, but going into this series here this weekend? Um, so I'm going to pull up what I started to write. <laughs> so I was looking at like D1 softball and softball America, which I like to subscribe to, to this time of year, this time of year. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, so Duke is actually one of the only teams in the country that ranks in the top 20 in runs per game, slugging on base percentage and pitching. <laughs> Oh, boy. So not only can they hit well, they also pitch very well. Um, they have a girl on their team, Claire Davidson, um, who was the ACC player of the year, who is, she's very good. She's, <laughs> she just, she's very good. <laughs> Apparently she used to, I read this, she used to pitch and hit, so like a very Odyssey Alexander type of oh, yeah. character. But when she was doing both, she actually wasn't very – she – it was – it deterred her from doing as well when she was mm -hmm. doing both things. So now she just hits, and now she's – I think it said like she has more doubles, home runs, and RBIs this season than she had in her first three seasons combined. Okay, so breakout year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and they said that she has the pitches that she has success against the most seem to be the pitches that CC, uh, Marissa, and Warren throw. <laughs> so <Great. laughs> we'll see. But. Yeah. Obviously, they've only had a they only have to prepare for one team. Mm -hmm. So they're very well aware of this. Coach talked this morning during a press conference about how they're going to try to figure out how they can kind of get her off balance so she doesn't, you know, kill them. <laughs> <laughs> so she Sound is like strategy. she was one. I think they had four other people that were all region. Um, they have a couple of other hitters that are really good. So the top of their lineup is like pretty stacked. Okay. And then they also have two very good pitchers. Um, Jayla, I think that's how you say her name, <laughs> right? She was the ACC pitcher of the year. Her ERA is 1.15. Wow. Okay. And she has 169 strikeouts. Jayla Wright. That is Jayla uh, Wright. Uh, there yeah. always seems to be a pitcher with Missy. I just, you know, I guess it's just at this point in the year, every team's just really good. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like, and they have a lefty, Casty Curd, who's also very good. Um, primarily a fastball pitcher. But so she's a lefty. Mizzou actually hits pretty well off lefties. Okay. Per the data that I was looking at. 
But like Anderson was saying this morning, playing in the SEC, which, you know, Duke doesn't plays in the ACC, not as strong of a conference. So, okay. Sorry to all the ACC fans out there. But, <laughs> a little less battle. I mean, yeah, yeah, not not the same thing. Like, this is nothing new mm -hmm. than what Mizzou faces every weekend. Sure. They're always facing incredible pitching. There's there's always a Jayla Wright <laughs> on one of the SEC teams. Sure. There's always, you know, Florida had four people who hit like in the upper 300s to 400. Like, so it's not... It's not like they present something that Mizzou has never seen before. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll, if they kind of do, like I said, the last time I was on, like if they play how they know how they should play, if they just focus on winning each pitch, they can have success. Okay. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what, you know, they don't care if it's Duke or not, whoever they're facing. Like, sure. they just got to worry about themselves at that moment, play Mizzou softball. Definitely. That's, so that's they the are, mantra. they're good. They're good. <laughs> they're good. In but conclusion. But base good this I time. I know, good. like, I... people tried to, like, talk about Omaha. Like, Omaha was, like, just because they're a mid-major that they're, like, some, like, <laughs> Oh my God! I can't believe Mizzou lost to. Uh... I was people. I was one of those people. I was that. Oh I was my that God! I, I, I said can't. this team can't lose to Omaha. It's Omaha. Believe. What are we doing? <laughs> this isn't a Power Five team. I am one of the. I was one of those people. I hand up. I, <laughs> I um, but yeah, Duke is Duke is very good. I think that's a good final sentence if you want for your <laughs> for your story in conclusion. Well, uh, the other thing. Yeah. That. Coach talked about, and I noticed when I was reading up on stuff, is that it's kind of crazy that Duke scores almost all their runs in like the fourth inning or later. Hmm. Okay. But I like in their six postseason games, they only scored like one run each in the first three innings, which is kind of crazy. And all of yeah. their runs, and they score like an average of six runs a game, came after fourth inning or after but coach said today and i agree with it i think that works that works in mizzou's favor because you're not having you don't need to have lauren kring's pitch right the entire game you can throw another pitcher at him and then they have to deal with that so i think that that does help mizzou that they have an arsenal of arms that they can throw at them and keep them off balance. Yeah, definitely. That's the, yeah, that's interesting. You know, or even if, you know, they have Krings, but it almost feels to me at this point, Krings gets better as the game goes on. So <laughs> as Duke gets warmed up and more dangerous, so does Lauren Krings or, or any of the other yeah. teams maybe in that. In that well, in, in like she had said over the weekend, you know, if, if at any point Krings had faltered, mm -hmm everybody else was ready to go. Like CC was ready to be the starter for that last game. Marissa was going to come in in the middle. If there was ever any indication, Taylor would come in at the end. So like they, they were all, they were just waiting in the wings <laughs> <laughs> They're ready to in, go. Case, in case they were needed. And it'll be the same sort of approach this weekend that I think it's probably Lauren Krings's games she's gonna be very how to see alexander like to go back to 2021 you know? oh that name that name <laughs> <know. laughs> there's oh. a lot of a lot of yelling at the tv that day <laughs> um uh well karen this has been awesome again everyone should should go read your your preview and obviously follow your coverage throughout the series i'm sure we'll we'll dm i'm sure i know i'll be watching kenny and peyton will be watching and uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a fantastic series. I'm going to end on this to go back to the boys in the boat in that theme. Uh, have you seen that movie, by the way? I have not. And now I really want to watch it. It's incredible. Okay. 
<laughs> I will I will put it on my I will put it on my list. I will put it on my list. I will I will I will give that a watch for sure. If you're a that, sucker for like inspirational sports. Oh yeah, love them. That's movies. so that, that Ugh, that's my yeah. that's my last question. What's your favorite uh sports movie? Um probably remember the Titans. Oh, it's a great choice. I watched that one <laughs> more than more than any of them. It's a great choice. Yeah, I Gosh, I love some inspiration sports. <laughs> and well, remember the Titans. Like no matter how many times I watch it, I know what's no, going to happen. Still cry. <laughs> yep, yep. No, it's. But it's, this it's one fantastic. was. I, I'll need to watch it again. You know, I've okay. only seen it this the one time in the theaters. But the Boys in the Boat was. It was excellent. Okay, I'll give that. I'll give that one a watch. My favorite movie in general of all time is Miracle, so that's why I like to ask people that question. I, I, I love that movie. It's great. The speech. Good call. Great. Good call. Well, Karen, thank you so much. We'll have you back on. Uh, you know, once they reach the College World Series, how's that? How's that sound? Sure. <laughs> not, to jinx them. not to jinx them or put too much pressure, but right. Either way, one um, pitch at a time. One pitch one at a time. Pitch. That's what, what Larissa Anderson says. But Karen, thank you so much for coming on and uh, enjoy the uh, series. Hopefully, the weather's not as uh, as bad this this weekend. It's nice today, so hopefully, it'll stay this way. Sounds good. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Okay, quick hits time. We're going to finish out the show. Jerseys of the week. First off, Kenny, what's your jersey of the week? Uh, my jersey of the week uh, goes to a former Mizzou basketball player, and that's Jesus Carrillero Martin, who is now committed to UTSA. Of course, he entered the transfer portal after this past season. Um, the grass is greener, I guess, a little bit. I think he'll probably have a, a better role at UTSA. Uh, it doesn't seem like a lot of people were very happy with him over the last couple of weeks of his tenure with the Tigers or more or less the season and very unfortunate for him, but hopefully he uh, finds a better role there. And uh, we remember Kayla Brown uh, took some photos of UTSA and UTSA, the Roadrunners ended up getting a different Mizzou transfer. A year later. Uh, Ke question. Kenny, yeah. why do you have oh. your recents folder up? Yeah. What the hell? Oh, my Put bad. I, I didn't uh, see that there. My, oh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> I think I don't think anyone will dispute um, Jesus Carolero Martin. He was just overmatched uh, in the SEC. It was just not working out uh, at Missouri at all. UTSA, you know, could have been a could have been your main bird, Kenny. Even um, the Roadrunners. I mean, that kind of I think that's more his more a spot for him. Uh, when I think about uh, the 0 and 19 season. Uh, and really just kind of the fumbling in the portal that Missouri did. My mind is, unfortunately, always going to go right to Jesus Carolero Martin. Uh, it's just, I think he was kind of just the poster boy for it by the end of the year. He took kind of the brunt of the ire of Mizzou fans. Um, you know, good luck to him at UTSA. Uh, I think it's a better <laughs> spot for him personally, but we'll see what happens for him. Okay, how about this? Um, we'll we'll, we'll uh, keep tabs on him. And if he's having a good season next year, it's only about a three-hour drive away from me if I'm oh. still in Houston at this time next no, year. You can't. And we did a similar thing with when Mizzou <laughs> played Texas A&M. I'll do it. Um, our TikTok hasn't been very active. If you maybe I, I repost a Sorry. couple things on there uh, from time to time, and you, good thing you can't see my likes on it. But uh, if we do do this, I'll uh, do another little video and I'll I'll ch heckle, not heckle, but I'll. I'll chant for Jesus Carlo Martin. I don't think this game will be very packed, the one I go to. So maybe I can sit right behind the bench and wear a, a Mizzou t shirt and let him know. Let him know that someone's supporting him. I do not think you should do that. Okay. I, I think th we should. Oh, do I this. think you should we'll go, absolutely do it. We'll go the first 10 games of the season. And if do he's averaging six plus points a game, then I'll go. Okay. Uh, How's that sound? Do, do we want to do that or or like a bet, some sort of bet where you have to go? I have, like no, have, no, I have no. I think that's I a good bet. It's a fair bet. If he if he All averages right. six six or more the points first, the first ten games of the season, how about uh, actually? I will yeah. go to a game. Okay. All right. I like this. I, bet. I feel like I he probably bet. wants to put his Mizzou tenure like in the rear view. I don't Can't know. If someone wants to Can't be reminded run. of it. <laughs> Just let him know uh, someone's cheering for him. That'll be me. 
Oh, so who who leaked this to John Rothstein? That that's who I also want to know. Like, who do you think told him this? Yeah, I was not expecting John Rothstein to be tweeting Jesus Carolaro Martin news. I thought yeah. he was supposed to be sleeping. Oh, yeah, it's me. It is me. Um, but I don't know. Uh, maybe it was UTSA's coach. Maybe it was Martin himself. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? All right, Peyton, what's your jersey? My jersey of the week is going to be Haley Frank. Uh, we're sticking with uh, Missouri Tigers on the move in the hoops ranks. Uh, of course, one of the more accomplished um, stat-wise um, Tigers in the women's program. I mean, she was on a lot of leaderboards scoring-wise uh, in her five years there. Uh, she is joining the professional uh, ranks, as you can see there from a tweet from Mizzou Women's Basketball. She's signed with the Sar Louis, or Sar Louis probably, uh, Royals over in Germany. Uh, so good luck to Haley Frank. Uh, she's the, I believe, the second Tiger in two years uh, to go overseas to play, obviously, the other being DeAndre Golston. Wait, Kenny, can you go back up to the name for a second? You've got like... You've got like a combo of some of some Missouri baseball teams here. Hear me out, because you got like you got the Lewis. It's probably Louis. Like oh, I get it. You yeah. got you got the Lewis, and then they're called the Royals. It's like both baseball teams. Haley Where's Frank, Haley Frank from? from? Missouri. Haley she's Frank's from Missouri. From she's from uh, Springfield. yeah. She's from Missouri. Cool. So yeah. So there so you go. Good for Haley Frank. Yes. Best of luck, to Haley Frank. She was great. Very consistent. Like every single season, she was. She was a stud, so hopefully she does well there. The rafters. That's what Bang I'm going to say. Retire the number. I, I don't know um, if we need to do all that, but she was very good. It's Robin Pinson's fault. I need to win more things. Uh, my jersey of the week, um, I'm giving it – the. you won't see the jersey on the tweet I am submitted for this, but I'm giving it to Anthony Edwards because he inspired something very funny. Uh, you kind of see this sometimes in the postseason where, you know – I know there was the whole thing like with the Cincinnati or Chiefs fans will know as well with the Cincinnati Bengals and the mayor doing that video and uh, uh, Travis Kelsey responded after they beat the Bengals. You see, you know, politicians getting involved in playoff time. Obviously, the Minnesota Timberwolves uh, are in the Western Conference Finals. Their best player is Anthony Edwards. I'm giving him the jersey. The governor of Minnesota, a guy called Tim Walls, I assume is how you pronounce Walls. that. Tim Walls, he uh, issued a proclamation declaring uh, May 22nd, 2024, which is Wednesday, which is when the series between the Wolves and Mavericks start, uh, Wolves Back Day. And he issued this proclamation. You can read it on Twitter if you want. But the first letter of each each little like paragraph in the proclamation spells bring your ass, which is what uh, Anthony Edwards told Charles Barkley to do. Uh, if you guys, if no, you didn't see that clip after the Wolves beat the Nuggets in seven games. Anthony Edwards is, is pretty funny. But yeah, if you look at the proclamation, it spells it spells that. I thought that was pretty funny. Also, one of the proclamations just says Nas Reed. Nas Reed and <laughs> Are you guys cheering for the Timberwolves? I, I do have the I, th yes. I think I'm gonna go Mavericks, but I do like the Timberwolves too. Both those teams are good. Yeah, it'll be I'm just rooting for a fun series, really. I mean, game one of the Eastern Conference Finals was pretty good. Um I don't really mind either one of Dallas or Minnesota winning. I think it's against my uh, my heritage to root for a Dallas team, especially in the playoffs. So That's I fair. think I, I can't root for uh, – I'm not even going to watch a game. So that doesn't really matter. I don't watch the NBA playoffs until the finals or unless my pookie-wookie Tyrese Halliburton is playing, and he's really good. Um, too bad Rick Carlisle's his he head is coach. Or he'd so be one and no, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's okay. unless he's playing. So I'm only watching him. I only watch him when he's on the floor. So whenever he's on the bench, I turn the game off. What the hell? Uh, How do you know he gets back on the floor? What happened? Uh, tweet what notifications. Happened? One last thing I want to say about uh, senators and politicians for sports. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's a curse uh, with Ted Cruz. Uh, yes, that Ted Cruz. Uh, <laughs> when he goes to Astros games, I don't know if you guys know this. I don't think the Astros have won a playoff game in the last like four seasons that he's attended. It's I it's a really bad that. stretch. So yeah. it's I would just be careful if you're a politician listening to us, and I know there's a lot. Uh, Governor Tim Walls, just be careful. Don't get your feet, you know, too. Or don't get your uh, ankles too deep in this in these waters. You know, just be careful. Be mindful of what you're saying. I mean, it's kind of already too late. He already issued a proclamation. So yeah, I guess the Mavericks won. Yeah, I think it's late. I don't know. I want Tamar Bates to say this at some point to a reporter after a Mizzou game. 
Bring your ass. Feel very cheap. We'll welcome anyone in Colombia, anyone and everyone. Uh, yeah, shout out Anthony Edwards. If the Mavericks really want to win this series, by the way, they should sign Reed Nico as a undrafted, as an undrafted player. Just and, put him on the bench. Yeah, it's just and Edwards will just see him and it's just he'll just start quaking. He'll be nervous. Uh, but yeah, shout out uh, Tim Walls. That was pretty funny. Next segment. I like no cap, he's the main bird. Shawnee's main bird of the week, uh, Kenny. Uh, my main bird of the week goes to the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, if you didn't know that they released their city connectors or uniforms uh, this past week, and I think it's safe to say it was a safe option. Um, I don't really see – I can see people getting, you know, bent out of shape that there just really wasn't anything cool about it, but I think it was just a safe option. And you're watching on the YouTube. Uh, it does have the bats with the birds on it, the regular red. Um, it says the Lou on it instead of St. Louis or Cardinals. And on the hat, it says STL and the font that's used throughout the city. And the, the city patch on the side is the arch uh, with the flag from St. Louis. Um, it was something like with the, the ownership that they wanted the birds on the bat. It's very historic for the franchise. and wanted to keep that alive. And, you know, red, when you think of the Cardinals, it's red. So I, I understand it. Pretty safe option to do it. Um, I don't know about you guys. I think this is just one of those that doesn't even seem like a city connect, but it's still uh, a nice uniform, I think, for, uh, for the Cardinals. Yeah, I mean, it's the city connects this season in general have just been very weak in my mind. I honestly think this is the best one just kind of by default. Um, not that I think it looks great. I think it looks kind of blah, but I mean, the red is kind of appealing. I like the Lou. I think that I think the change that says the Lou is cool. I think that yeah. is kind of neat. Um, but nothing else really kind of jumped out at me and made me think, oh, that's really cool. Um, you know, they had the wavy lines to represent the arch, I believe is what it was. Um, that didn't really do anything for me. Um, but it's an okay. It, it's a fine jersey. It's not. It's just middle of the road to me. Mm -hmm. I like I like the uh, STL hat. I, I actually I'm a fan of that. I th I think these are pretty cool. But you're I mean I don't I haven't compared them to the other City Connect jerseys. I like the video also. If you're watching on the YouTube, I haven't watched. This is the first time I'm watching this video. It was a cool video. Kind of showcased the. I like that they put the other sports in there and stuff like that. That was kind of fun. Um, yeah, shout out St. Louis. I guess that's a, a solid jersey. Um, or yeah, they're solid jersey. We're I what got confused when I said jersey. I was like we tip jerseys of the week anyway um my main this is my oh main my bird. Gosh, this is Jack. what 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 this is Sorry. my main bird of the Don't week watch. um my main bird of the week is going to be follow along here my main bird is ben sternberg okay ben sternberg because you know, yet you'd think but because our famous i like no cap and he's the main bird comes from the Sternberg scoop. So that is my connection to the main bird. Um, the reason I chose Ben Sternberg for my main bird is because Missouri is hosting Lindenwood once again this season uh, on Wednesday, November 27th. I believe that's the day before Thanksgiving. Um, I don't, I don't know the exact calendar days, but um, so Missouri, we, uh, this comes from made for March, by the way. Uh, on Twitter. So it's not official or anything like that. Yes, it is the day before Thanksgiving. Um, not official or anything like that, but Missouri, of course, has hosted Lyndon Wood in the past. And uh, Ben Sternberg famously had a very bad beat uh, when he crow hopped and sunk a half court three pointer for Missouri to cover the spread uh, in Dennis Gates' first season at the helm of Missouri uh, to beat Lyndon Wood. Um, so yeah, rivalry, in-state rivalry renewed, guys. This is big stuff. I think, uh, I, yeah, Ben Sternberg's got to be at this game, right? This feels like a requirement. I think he's, I think he, he needs should to be. be. He should, he should be it out for this one. He, yeah, he has to be in attendance. I don't know. Maybe we'll quote, we we'll quote tweet that tweet and we'll, that'll be our bat signal. And Sternberg has to be there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, these buy games, I don't like when they put the actual monetary amount has one more game of eligibility remaining. Um, I don't like when they put the amount for the buy game. That feels like a, you know, you're just begging for a, an upset, but hopefully that does not happen for uh, Mizzou when they face in-state rivalry too. Lindenwood, gotta watch out for the gotta watch out, out for, for the those arch. Lions. 
Yeah, Battle for, mm-hmm. for the Arch. They should they should do it every year, kind of like how Drinkwitz, you know, milked the whole we're the Tennessee State champions. I think basketball should play every Missouri team. So SEMO, Missouri State, Kansas oh. City, St. Uh, St. Louis, Lindenwood. Slow. There is a legitimate SEMO. reason Missouri does not do that. <laughs> and I will say I'd love to see Mo State on the schedule. I'd love to see yeah. uh, come back to Mizzou Arena. Especially because they're um they're they're FBS now in football. I know that's we're talking a different sport, but you know. Yeah. Conzo still be... recruits recruits football too. Oh yeah, and to be the Conzo Bowl. His be best funny. recruit after his first year at Missouri was a football recruit, as Kenny <laughs> likes to say. Yeah. Um, all right, Peyton. I'm sorry I skipped your main bird. I don't know what was going through my brain. My main bird of the week. Uh, we're going to the world of football. I don't have actually a connection for the bird. I just put it in here. Um Oh, here you go. Chabby Alonzo, Bayer Leverkusen's manager, used to play for Liverpool. Their logo has a bird on it. There you go. Uh, they're our team, Bayer Leverkusen. We've mentioned them on the show several times. Uh, they did it, Kenny and Peyton. They won the German League without losing a game. They did not lose a single game all season. If you don't know that much about soccer, that is incredibly hard to do. Uh, they played 34 games, 28 wins, six ties, zero losses. Uh, they actually, in fact, they, they're, they compete in a couple other competitions too. have not lost a game in those. They play for a European trophy on Wednesday when we're recording this. Uh, it is just hilarious to me. I know I'm a bigger soccer fan than Peyton and Kenny that we decided, you know, as a bit have a show's team. And then they went and had one of the most incredible seasons like ever. So congrats to Bayer Leverkusen. I I've tried to like compare this to college, like, like to, you know, American sports. This would be like Kenny and Peyton. Think of Mizzou's last season, but instead of the Cotton Bowl and they win that kind of coming out of nowhere, they go undefeated and win the national championship by like 25 points. That's like what this is. So congrats to Bayer Leverkusen. Go Lions, man. My Leverkusen Lions. I uh, am a big fan, obviously. I love Jabi Alonzo. Who is this right here? Yeah, Peyton, Next can you name one, one player on the team? Oh, God, I used to know the best players. This is the best player. I forgot his name. Uh, what is it? I've totally forgot. His first name is Florian. I don't know it then. Never mind. Works. <laughs> Good job, Kenny. Thank you. I know the I team. Have to, yeah, Kenny, I do admire your your for, Peyton. I understand, but Kenny, I I do admire your your foray into the into the world of Bayer Leverkusen. I I respect it. It is fun. Um. So yeah, they're they're gonna they're gonna finish. They have two more games. They can win two more trophies. Uh, if they win them both and and do what's called a, a treble, which is a, a a popular achievement or like not well, it doesn't happen that often, but it's a notable achievement in soccer. And then yeah, we'll have to follow them again next season. Uh, their coach is staying, so you know they should, be really, they should be really good again. At least one more year before he gets probably poached by a bigger team. But congrats to Bayer Leverkusen on winning the German title and not losing a single game. We are. It's because we are became fans. It's the it's the unwritten rule effect. Uh, all right. Best things you learned, Peyton. What did you learn this week? Best thing I learned this week: the Broadway Diner uh, took after a very popular Mizzou Twitter uh, suggestion. Um, someone on on uh, the Mizzou Reddit originally suggested uh, that Missouri a restaurant in in Como needed to put an onion ring appetizer on their menu and call them K-Rings or Krings, if you can't follow along with that, and charge 364, which is the amount of pitches she threw in two days, uh, in honor of her efforts this weekend. And the Broadway Diner, they went out and they did it. You can go to the Broadway Diner, get 15 onion rings or K-Rings, Krings, um, for 364. Cool little gesture. Um, I'm sure it's not permanent, but, uh, you know, it's cool to see um, Como kind of rally around the softball team and do stuff like this. Yeah, I was unaware. This is fire. I, I didn't know Looks about good. I didn't know about this. They do look good. They look like some good under rings. That, 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 that's a cool it's a cool tradition. So whoever steps up against Duke will have to be the they'll have to get an appetizer or something named after them. Yeah, Lauren Krings is. That was a special performance uh, by her over the course of this regional. Pretty. Do you think they have an option experience. with uh, that, that aren't fried? You know, I'm a guy that maybe I don't really want the fried onion ring. You just I just want to like, eat onion rings. I just want, I onion just want rings? the ring from the onion. Yeah, 
Is that too much to ask? You want them to bring you, cut you a raw onion, put it in ring form, and bring it to you. Yes. I think it'd be good. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just me? You're an insane person. Uh, what did you learn? This is ridiculous. What did you learn? <laughs> uh, best thing I learned this week is that Mad Max is all, it's not always Matt, the former Mizzou pitcher. Had a pretty cool story while he was on a rehab assignment uh, in the minor leagues for the Rangers system. And usually when you're a professional, I mean, a major league pitcher or just any major league player, you get a big spread. I mean, you buy a lot of food um, for the players down there, the ones that aren't making as nearly as much money as you are. And, uh, Mad, and Mad Max did that. Max Scherzer spent upwards of $7,000, according to Fox Sports, uh, with ribeye, filet mignon, and lobster. Um, this is just a really cool thing. And one of the things he did uh, that was really cool as well, he's just got everyone AirPods. I think that's always like a go-to um, to get everyone AirPods. Uh, you see it sometimes in football too with like a running back um, getting his offensive linemen some like, custom headphones, custom uh, AirPods. And golf carts. really just golf carts, yes, to that too. So this is just a really cool uh, gesture by Max Scherzer. M-I-Z, first of all. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm... I want to say Max Scherzer has done this a couple times then if he did this with the Rangers, because I remember him doing something similar when I think he was on the nationals. Um, so he just seems like a very good natured dude. Um, yeah, it's, it's a cool tradition. You know, baseball is kind of a game that is rich in traditions in general. Um, this is one of the better ones though. It's like I the think... opposite. Sorry, go ahead, Kenny. Yeah, I think uh, he probably did it with the Mets, too, because this photo that Fox Sports used um, on this graphic, that's a uh, Binghamton Rumble Ponies jersey, which is double A for the Mets. <laughs> okay, then maybe that's what I'm thinking of. And probably the most recent one would have been the Mets, yeah. Flexing the ball knowledge. Uh, this this is like, it's like the opposite of the rookie dinner in football, where it's like you have like the rookie dinner where they have to pay for like a super expensive meal with their first check. It's like the opposite. It's the veteran paying for probably mostly the young guys who aren't making any money's uh, stuff. Good for Max Scherzer. Um, best thing I learned this week, I'm going back to the old reliable message board geniuses. I did this, I used them last week for a Mizzou related thing. And they put our good friend Gabe DeArmond to post from him on Power of Mizzou, which is why I'm allowed to use this because message board geniuses got it. I wouldn't directly take uh, anything off of the message board. But uh, yeah, message board geniuses posted a post from Gabe where he did, uh, he did if SEC teams were NFL teams. Not necessarily anything I learned here. I just thought we could uh, we could discuss it if you guys would like to. Uh, Gabe also had a funny uh, quote tweet of it. I'll, I'll try and find it. Oh, he said, I'm still 18 years short of retirement age, but I'm not sure it gets any better than this. Made at board geniuses and the replies aren't calling me profane names. Yeah, his I, I didn't think his comparisons were too bad. I thought uh, I thought he actually like kind of nailed it. Uh, I'll, I'll rattle through. So he had Georgia as the Chiefs, Alabama, the Patriots, LSU, the Packers. Florida, the Giants, Tennessee, the Bills, Texas A&M Chargers, Texas Eagles, South Carolina Panthers, uh, Arkansas Browns, Vanderbilt Cardinals, Oklahoma Ravens, Mizzou, the, the Oilers slash Titans, shout out Kenny, uh, Ole Miss, Saints, Mississippi State, Jags, Auburn, the Raiders, and Kentucky, the Detroit Lions. Thoughts, gentlemen? Well, the first thing I was going to notice was that this is the first time I've seen a message board geniuses where the majority of the replies say this is actually pretty good. So good mm -hmm. on Gabe. I mean, most of the replies are on his side, uh, actually. Uh, I love the A&M Chargers comp. Uh, <laughs> what was that? Wait, what was that tweet? You ever mm -hmm. notice how Mizzou fans are consistently yeah. the smartest and most grounded on the Internet? <laughs> Um, that's for damn sure. <laughs> the the a and Chargers comp I love because his reasoning was uh, the best team in the division, conference, and wherever until <laughs> the games actually start. <laughs> I think that is dynamite uh, for the Chargers and the Aggies. I also think LSU Green Bay is a very good comp. That's a uh, good one. I think that was a good – I really think most of these are pretty damn good. Uh, so good on Gabe DeArmond. Uh Sorry that Mizzou is the Oilers, uh, Kenny. It's fine. Uh, I'm sure that hurts. Uh, but if it makes you feel any better, Earl Campbell may be a Titan, but Larry Roundtree is still a Tiger. So, <laughs> uh, the one thing I really liked about it, I think they're all right. Like I, I was going through this. I think maybe you can 
look at a new one for Kentucky that's not the Lions, but I still think that's good. Uh, Ar- or, uh, Oklahoma being the Ravens is hilarious to me because there's there's overlap. Like there's probably of all these uh, on here, maybe Alabama, and the Patriots, but uh, Oklahoma and the Ravens, there's there's con- pretty good overlap there um, with two of like the most recent offensive weapons uh, for the Ravens being from Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. There are a fair amount of Oklahoma players there, aren't there? Yeah, it gets a good point. I was trying to think of a different one for Alabama because I think like with Saban still there, I think like it's just too easy. Well, I think I think with the Patriots one, it is. I was trying to think of like, is there like a team that like was really good and then now has a new like kind of coach and identity but i i think yeah i think the patriots is still pretty fitting i couldn't think of a better one for them but yeah these are mostly great i think i do um, agree like i think the worst one on there is probably kentucky being the lions i don't really yeah. think of that i i like when i think of kentucky at least in recent years like under Mark Stoops, they've been a pretty consistently like decent SEC team. The Lions have really just been really good for like a year. So I don't think there's that. That's one I would change. Maybe I don't the... really know that I'd change any. Wait, else. I'm confused. Falcons. Yeah, they could or be the, the Saints, Falcons. but I mean, wait, the, wait, the wait. Saints have won the Super Bowl, so that's kind of a little bit hard. Well, and I'm... he had the Saints on here as Ole Miss. Oh, I'm yeah. confu- wait, wait, I'm confused about that. Why does it say? Both had a Manning who was pretty good, but generally the team isn't all that good. Who did the Saints? Because Ole Miss had Eli, Saints had Archie. Oh, I didn't know the Saints had Archie Manning. I'm just stupid. <laughs> so, I was like, wait, uh, what? Like, like that would uh, like I don't know if I'd say Ole Miss is the Saints. Really, I do think there is some overlap there, but for the most part, I think this is really good. Like Mississippi State Jags, I think that's spot on. Tennessee uh, Bills is great. That's a good yeah. one. I, I Close, think always there's... always the bridesmaid. And the most relevant, both the Bills and the Titans were where it was in the '90s. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think these are for the most part really good. Eagles yeah, there was a good. there was some Tennessee fans. So I saw some replies. They were not they were not excited about being the Bills. <laughs> they are the Bills, man. Sorry. <laughs> who uh, who's like the cra- I'm trying to think for Bills. Pure, who would be the Bills fan base? Like, who's the craziest? Like, jump through tables because like the SEC doesn't really have. Like that, like they have passionate fans, but I don't know if they have like uh, who's like the, who's like the most insane fan base that would like jump through a flaming table. Georgia fans SEC. love to bark at people, but Georgia fans, fans are, are actually crazy. pretty normal for SEC standards. I don't know how everyone else feels about Georgia fans. I've never really had a problem with them. Florida fans, I, I wouldn't say that. I feel like uh, I don't know that much about like the auras of the Vanderbilt fan, like, fans. Yeah, <laughs> Vanderbilt definitely. Um, whose stadium is under construction in the NFL? That's who you give Vanderbilt to, and Mizzou now or soon. Uh, I don't. I don't think there is any. Lambo, 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 a bunch of Lambo weird Field's people. always under construction. No one really goes over the edge. I mean, you can get into schools like LSU, That's Ole Miss. Saying. Yeah, like they like to party. I mean, they'll have a good time. Auburn Florida when they're good. Stuff on trees. But who's like the craziest oh. college football fan base? Like, UMass? I feel like I don't. <laughs> UMass. 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 <laughs> we'll find out. I, it it's could. A big party school. I don't know. Like, there's no fan base in college that is, like, jumping through tables. Right. Was it Tennessee that threw stuff on the field a couple years ago? Yes, it was. Yes. That's true. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. I mean, I did dealing think with it, them on Twitter, too. They're pretty, they're pretty out I think there. It's just, I think it's just different because in college, it's all just, you know, they're just drunk students everywhere. So you Walk just kind of get... Walk into Tennessee in a Georgia jersey, by the way, you'll get called some colorful names. In a Georgia jersey? Yeah. Do they yeah. hate Georgia more than Alabama? I don't know, but I there is a video out there that a guy posts like every. Oh, I've year. seen that video. I know that of video. him walking around kneeling. Uh, yeah, they're they're very very tasteful people uh, at at Tennessee. That's for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, all right. Well, I thought that was a good list. Good band. Game. Good discussion. Or what? You said no doubt. Good band. Gwen Stefani. <laughs> Check them out. I didn't know she was in that until like a few months ago. That's yeah, good call, Kenny. Um, Apple Music top 100 albums of all time they're putting out. Everyone, listen to that. There's some pop culture for you. All right, we'll Don't wrap worry. up the show. Peyton, do you have a joke for us? Uh, I don't because I, for whatever reason, forgot that I do that. Don't we have a ratio? Oh, do we have a ratio? 
Oh, I said that's something, didn't I? Oh, yeah, that's on, on Sundays. Sundays. Kenny won't be involved for that. So we'll get to that Sunday. Well, All regardless, right. uh, what's a, a, a Pirates? This one comes from our favorite TV series, The Today Show, by the way. Kenny, get back in here. You're not going to hide and beat look insane over there on your own. Um, what is a Pirate's favorite letter? R. R. <laughs> C. You'd think it's, oh, it's an C. R, it's C. It's but C. it's the C. I got it. I got it before you said it. Nope. I was already in the middle. Of I the got it. Line. It doesn't count. Sorry. Tuesday. We almost unplugged my mic. All right. Uh, we'll see you guys Friday. We or Monday. Sorry. We'll see you guys Monday. We will have a recap. Peyton and I will of however the softball regional super regional goes. Hopefully we're talking Tigers in the College World Series by then. Until then, put in the comments if you listen this far. I'll put a poll on the Spotify show if you listen to that. Uh, who has the craziest SEC fan base? That's your homework. And tell some stories. If you have stories of any particular uh, fan bases that went crazy, put them in the comments. Thank you. Uh, all right. Until then, see you guys Monday. Bye-bye. <laughs>